Hello, everyone. So a big story in the news right now is uh, Russian soldiers fleeing the city of Liman. And uh, according to the reports that I have been reading, uh, the Russian troops were basically being surrounded and they were also outnumbered. And um, what I read was that there were around 2,500 Russian soldiers in uh, Liman, and uh, they were being surrounded by about 3,500 Ukrainian soldiers. So the Russian troops were obviously outnumbered. They were surrounded. And uh, for the Russians, it really wasn't uh, worth it to just uh, force these soldiers to stay in a position where they would be just fish in a barrel. It would be like hunting an animal in, uh, in an arena where, you know, it has nowhere to escape. And so uh, the Russians knew that if they kept the troops in Liman, that uh, they would be slaughtered if they uh, tried to fight, or they would uh, just easily surrender. And so, according to the Russian reports, uh, the Russians have simply uh, retreated to a more advantageous position. This is what the Russians are saying. Of course, the Ukrainians are in a state of hoorah, hoorah, and uh, people are saying that uh, Russia is losing and uh, Ukraine is on the path to victory. Now, this... Uh, defeat of uh, Russian troops took place in the midst of Russia uh, making a declaration that Donbass uh, are uh, part of Russia. And the, uh, the Russians uh, have uh, superintended a, a referendum, or multiple referendums, I should say. And Supposedly, the Russian people in these regions voted uh, in favor of being a part of the Russian Federation. Of course, you have people in the Western world arguing that uh, these referendums are uh, shams and that they are uh, illegal and illegitimate. But the reality is that you have an entire population of people in Donbass uh, who believe that they are a part of Russia, and therefore they believe that the Ukrainian government uh, has no right over them whatsoever, and that the Ukrainian government uh, governing uh, the regions in Donbass are doing so illegitimately and illegally. And therefore, they see the Ukrainian government as illegally occupying them. And as long as people believe that, as long as you have people believing that, you are going to have conflict. So the Russians say Donbass is now uh, a part of the Russian Federation. Luhansk and, and Donetsk, these are uh, parts of the Russian Federation. And then you have this loss that happens, wherein Russian troops have no choice, really, but to retreat. What this tells me is that this war is not going to end anytime soon. Because you have Russia saying, this belongs to us. You have an entire population of people in uh, northeastern Ukraine saying, no, we are a part of Russia. This land belongs to Russia. It doesn't belong to Ukraine. And you have lots of people with guns. You have militias, paramilitaries, and plus you have a very powerful country, Russia, a, a world superpower, or really at least a major regional superpower, uh, backing you up, backing up the claim that this land belongs to the Russian Federation. So this is uh, obviously a perfect formula for perpetual conflict. And what this tells me is that this war is not going to end anytime soon. It's uh, more than likely going to last for years. And there are going to be books uh, written about this war, and they're going to make movies about it. 
and it's going to be like uh, Yugoslavia. The Yugoslav uh, conflict against Belgrade lasted for an entire decade. I know people will say, uh, well, no, you know, there were multiple wars that happened. There was the, the Croatian uh, War for Independence and the Bosnian War for Independence and the Albanian War for Independence, but really all of these uh, conflicts were against one government, and that was Belgrade, and this uh, conflict against Belgrade lasted for a decade. And it looks like this is going to be basically a similar case with, uh, with Ukraine. Uh, even if Ukraine takes over all of Donbass and they put their soldiers there, they settle their soldiers there, you're going to have paramilitaries, you're going to have militias, you're going to have uh, guerrilla warfare, you're going to have Russia arming these militants. It's just not going to end. It's not going to end, and I think uh, that uh, in the next uh, coming years, what will happen is this conflict is just going to continue on, and it's going to be perfect uh, propaganda material for other countries to justify what they want to do. For example, Germany will say, look at this terrible conflict. It's happening right nearby us. It's happening on the edge of Europe. Europe needs to uh, grab its own destiny and uh, uh, grab life by the by the ears and just move independently without America. The Germans will use this uh, as justification to, to boost up their military. You already have the Chancellor of Germany, uh, Mr. Olaf uh, Scholz, saying uh, that Germany must be the most powerful military in all of Europe. This is huge news, and I remember hearing about this weeks ago. I remember hearing weeks ago about how Olaf Scholz uh, said that German, Germany must have the most powerful military in all of Europe in order to defend Europe. And this was getting little to no serious attention. And to me, it was the biggest story of the week, the biggest story of the month. Imagine that, Germany, a country that became so powerful, a country... Uh, that started an empire, you know, 70 plus years ago, a country that was so powerful that it took several major countries to defeat it, America, Russia, uh, a huge chunk of France. It took all of these different peoples to fight against Germany to defeat Germany. This country is now saying we got to get our military back. We got to make our military powerful again. That's horrifying. That is horrifying. But this is being done uh, upon the the upon the uh, upon all the attention that this war in Ukraine is receiving. Because this war in Ukraine is happening, Germany is now saying we got to bring our military back, and nobody is disagreeing. Nobody is bringing up questions about this. Nobody is objecting. Nobody is calling this into question. Nobody is expressing uh, incredulity or, or suspicion about this. Nobody. Everybody's just saying, oh, yes, yes, Deutschland, Deutschland, Uber, alles, bring back the Ubermensch, bring back the Reich, bring back the Führer. That's basically what's happening. I mean, they're not saying bring back Hitler, but they're saying bring back German power in Europe, bring back the military might of Germany. It's a huge story. And, uh, you know, with that said, I'm not going to sit here and say that Russia is, is perfect. Russia has done some pretty terrible things. The way I look at it is a leopard does not change its spots. A zebra doesn't change its, its, uh, its stripes. European countries were in perpetual conflict for millennia. These last past seven plus decades have had an unprecedented amount of peace. Excluding, of course, the little conflicts that have taken place since the end of the Second World War, the Balkans, uh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Georgia, etc. But nonetheless, we have seen, since the end of the Second World War, the world has enjoyed unprecedented peace. If you read about Europe in the Second World War and prior to the Second World War, Europe was pretty much in perpetual conflict. 
you had the First World War, and then before the First World War, Balkan Wars. You had the war between uh, Prussia and Austria. Uh, it, was, it was just nonstop war, civil war in Finland. I mean, it was just non nonstop conflict. If you read about Europe in the 1500s, uh, 1400s, 1600s, 1700s, it's just nonstop wars. The Thirty Years' War, and then you had, what, 50 years of war between Spain and France in the 1600s, just nonstop. Non the, the, the Napoleon, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte rising up, uh, the, the Napoleonic Wars, I mean, it was just nonstop. The Ottoman Empire, I mean, it just didn't, it didn't end. It just didn't end. So what's happening What's happening is that this wave of peace that we have been enjoying so much has been slowly deteriorating. And of course, we have seen many signs of this, but it's slowly deteriorating. And as this conflict continues on in Ukraine, other countries are also going to begin to show their true colors. Well, Ru Russia is going to be used as the pretense for all of it. Well, we have to make our military powerful again. Why Russia? Well, we need to go to war with Greece. Turkey. Uh, why? Well, the Greeks are, uh, they are our enemies, and, uh, you know, we have Russia rising up, and we need to take full control over uh, our territories, and the Greeks are militarizing these island, islands on the Aegean Sea. It, we're just living in unstable times right now. We got to go to war. We have to make our military strong, very strong. We got to bring back the Ottoman Empire. The Chinese, of course, are, are, are building up their military. Their military is not perfect. They still have a lot of gaps in their military force, regardless of what a lot of people say. A lot of people talk as if China is like the biggest army in the world after America. Yeah, they have a big military, but that doesn't mean they're efficient. Um, uh, uh, quality or quantity does, does not always defeat quality. In fact, quality is almost is always better than quantity, most of the time at least. Um, and then you have the Japanese. Look, Russia has invaded uh, Ukraine. You know, the Chinese are going to be empowered by this. They're going to invade Taiwan. What are we going to do? The Japanese are, are boosting up their military might. So basically, when we read about the past and we say, look at all these wars, look at how barbaric everybody was. Look, see how different we are today. We're civilized. We have iPhones. We have trans rights, LGBT rights. Look how civilized we are. The bottom line is, eventually, the veneer is going to uh, is going to uh, tear itself apart, and uh, people are going to go back to how they used to be. Countries are going to go back in a way to how they used to be with militarism. And uh, you know, this conflict with Russia between Russia and Ukraine to me, it's it's just I don't I don't see it any I don't I don't see it ending anytime soon. Uh, it's like Armenia versus Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, you can have some peace treaties here and there, uh, but they're going to be broken. Uh, because, you know, there, there was a war, uh, in 2020, in September of 2020, thousands upon thousands of people died in just what? A little bit over a month of fighting? And... There was a ceasefire, and that didn't last long at all. And then you have more peace talks, and that doesn't work. Same thing happened between uh, Kazakhstan and Tajikistan. Tajikistan attacked Kazakhstan. The leaders of the countries get together. They say, hey, we're not going to do that. And Tajikistan attacks, not, ta not Kazakhstan, sorry, um, uh, Kyrgyzstan. Tajikistan attacked Kyrgyzstan. The leaders got together. Uh, their respective uh, leaders got together and they said, okay, we're not going to do that again. And not too long after that, Tajikistan attacked Kyrgyzstan again. And hundreds of people died. There was a peace talk between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Without any provocation, Azerbaijan attacked Armenia and uh, over 200 Armenians were killed. So the 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 hatred the antagonism between Ukraine and, and Russia it goes back a long long ways it goes back a very long ways um, you know initially Ukrainians didn't call themselves Ukrainians they called themselves Ruthenians and it wasn't until I want to say what 1920s maybe before that a little bit before that that they started calling themselves Ukrainians and the the, the Ruthenians 
they were split between different factions. One, one, one faction was pro-Russia. I think one faction was pro-Poland. One faction wanted to make their own sort of Slavic identity. And then one, one faction said, no, we're Ukrainians. We're not Ruthenians. We're Ukrainians. And uh, that faction became the dominating faction. And eventually, uh, the, the uh, Ukrainians, they wanted uh, independence from Russian power. They fought for it. Uh, uh, the Soviets would invade them, and uh, Soviet Union controlled Ukraine, and Poland and, and, uh, and Ukraine uh, made an alliance against the Soviets. Poland uh, invaded Kiev. The Russians ran away. People said, look, the Poles are winning, and the Russians came back and, and crushed them, and the Poles and the Ukrainians retreated. And that was in the 1920s. In the 1940s, uh, the Ukrainians would eventually butcher the Poles, and the Russians would come in and rescue the Poles from the Ukrainians. Today, you have the Poles making uh, uh, the Poles uh, having a very deep alliance with the Ukrainians against the Russians. But this, uh, who knows? This may change in the future, just as it did in the past. And the Ukrainians could continue to take massive amounts of territory. This is possible. What's going to happen if you have major Ukrainian victories, more of these major Ukrainian victories? You could have a situation where Ukrainian nationalists will go out and hunt down every ethnic Russian that they can find. And if you think that that's impossible, look at what happened uh, when the Germans invaded Poland and... They, uh, uh, they, they took all this territory and they empowered the Ukrainian nationalists. And the Ukrainian nationalists, because the Ukrainians were under Polish control before the Germans invaded. Why were the uh, Ukrainians under Polish control? Because there was a war, Ukrainian-Polish war. And the Poles defeated the Ukrainians and the Poles took a huge, they took huge chunks of, of Ukraine, Ukrainian territory. Because historically that belonged to Poland, supposedly historic. I mean, I'm not too knowledgeable about the history, but that's what's said. And uh, for example, the city of Lvov, the region of Lvov, was definitely historically uh, Polish. It was one of the centers of Polish culture, and it was under Ukraine, and the Poles took it back. Now it's 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 under Ukraine, but at one point it was under Polish uh, control, and uh, when the Germans came. They, they uh, empowered these Ukrainian nationalists. The Ukrainian nationalists were so upset that the Poles had occupied them for so long that they went out and they hunted down every, any Pole that they could find, and they raped and they butchered. Same thing could happen in, in the near future, where the, here are uh, the Russians controlling uh, large uh, swaths of land in Ukraine. The Ukrainians retake the territory, and you have these Ukrainian nationalists, just as their ancestors did, hunting down every ethnic Russian that they could find because they s will see these ethnic Russians as occupiers or as allies to the occupiers. So that's my thoughts on that. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say that the Russians are saints. The Russians have done some pretty terrible things. Uh, there was a video that came out uh, a couple of weeks ago. I didn't watch it. I found the video, but I don't want to watch these things. But it's a video of a Russian soldier cutting off the private parts of a Ukrainian. It's horrific. There is a video that you can watch of a Russian uh, Nazi, uh, Nazi, a Russian skinhead who's fighting the Ukrainians, saying that we defeated the Russians in one battle and we destroyed their tanks and we could smell the the odor of of burning ukrainian flesh and he says there's no there's no better smell than the the smell of uh burning uh ukrainian flesh he says i love the smell of it it was amazing he says i felt he said that i began to salivate smelling uh uh burning ukrainian flesh and uh it's horrific and you know during the second world war you had all these big powers fighting each other soviet union versus the germans and it was like a giant blender that was just blending up all sorts of, just blending up human flesh. And it was just a, a, a storm of, of gore and carnage. And you had Ukrainians butchering Poles and, and vice versa with, with Polish uh, uh, retaliation against ethnic Ukrainians. 
Soviet Union uh, butchering people by the millions, uh, the, the Nazis butchering people by the millions, is just this endless blender of carnage. And I think that's what we're heading towards. Russians butchering Ukrainians, Ukrainians butchering Russians, and it's just going to escalate into uh, the bloodlands. And, and Europe is going to become another land of blood. So those are my thoughts on that. Uh, you guys just heard some theology. God bless. Jak opadam z sił 